Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IBM Qiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. I'm your host, Lev Kaminev from IBM Quantum Research, and in just a minute, I'll be thrilled to roll out this week's seminar uh, with a very special guest of ours, Join Tufel from, the, from NIST, Boulder, who will talk about interfacing superconducting quantum circuits with an RF photonic link. And before we begin, as usual, we like to start it off by asking, where is everybody tuning in from today? And you can reply to that in the comment chat box here on YouTube, which is either located on your right, below, above, somewhere on your screen. And that's the same place where you can ask questions of John, myself, and also other folks in the chat live during the talk, and we can discuss and, uh, and make this as in-person and lively as possible. And I see that today we have folks from France, New York, Bangladesh, uh, India, California, Italy, Germany, Texas, Arizona. It's great to see everybody making all the different time zones. Uh, very thrilled to have you guys all. <clears throat> now, if uh, you are also interested in internships, we just launched and announced the uh, Kiskit 2022 internships, I believe. So take a look on social media to find out more about that. And I think folks with that, it's time we begin. I am thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series dedicated to you, the research and academic communities. I'm your host, Latko Minnev, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting John Tufel from NIST Boulder, who will talk about interfacing quantum circuits with RF Photonic Link. Hello, John. How are you today? Hey, Zlatko. I'm doing well. And yourself? Good. Uh, very glad to have you here. Um, I think I shared a little bit before this. I think you might be one of my favorite speakers, so we're really looking forward to this. Uh, where are you today, John? Uh, I'm broadcasting from my home just outside Boulder, Colorado. Well, we're, we're very glad uh, you accepted our invitation. Uh, before we begin, uh, allow me to give a little bit of background. John uh, D. Tufo is an experimental physicist at uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. John received his PhD in physics from Yale University, my alma mater. John went on to JILA as a post-tutorial researcher working on microwave optomechanical circuits. And uh, now John is uh, part of the Advanced Microwave Photonics Group at NIST, where he has pioneered efforts in engineering, superconducting, microwave circuits and uh, quantum mechanics rather in macroscopic mechanical systems, which is what we'll hear a lot about today. John has received many awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, as well as the Department of Commerce Silver Medal. So with that introduction, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, John. Well, thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks to yourself and to Paul and for everyone both for the seminar and for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm excited to tell you about some of our, our recent experimental work that finally got published now during the pandemic and, and things that we're excited to move on to as we move back into the lab. So uh, with that, I'll start by saying, you know, this is work done by our group, the Advanced Microwave Photonics Group, and also specifically a collaboration we've had with the Frequency Comb and Photonics Group uh, Scott Denims and Frank Quinlan were intimately involved, and it's kind of that cross-pollination of ideas and expertise at NIST Boulder that helped some of these ideas come to fruition. Let's see if I can get my slides and my pointer going. Great. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to say on the outset, I mean, this work that I'll talk about is really spearheaded by Flora Lecoq. He's a senior researcher in our group that really uh, turned some of these ideas into actual measurements that we'll talk about. And Frank Quinlan, again, was the counterpart on the optic side, really bring the photonics technology to the kind of superconducting low temperature circuits that are my bread and butter and the things I know and love. So just a brief outline, I'm kind of introduce the microwave quantum circuits that we think about in our group, some of the broader technologies. And then the overarching theme of the talk will be really connecting to other parts of the EM spectrum beyond the microwave. Specifically, I'll talk about using some photonics, which is usually a no-no when you're talking about dill fridges and superconducting qubits. And I'll talk about some of the networking uh, that we're thinking about and involved with. 
and that uses quantum MEMS. And the MEMS are on the low energy scale of the spectrum, down at the megahertz regime. And then lastly, I'll talk about pushing into yet a third regime, maybe going up from the microwave to the millimeter, some of the pros and cons and, and the very preliminary ideas we're thinking about in that direction. So just a brief introduction to the group. We are the Advanced Microwave Photonics Group at NIST. Our tools are very much uh, in the heart of this seminar. It's dill fridges, it's microwave circuits, it's nanofabrication, cryogenics. Uh, with that technology, we tackle a number of applications. Uh, we are NIST, so part of NIST's mission is fundamental science and metrology, but it is really also enabling the industry. And I'm excited that there's this burgeoning quantum industry out there. So a lot of the applications we are, uh, again, is not building the full scale things ourselves, but really having novel ideas and innovations for the areas of quantum computing, networking, transduction, and sensing. So as I said, I'll, I'll remind the audience again, why do we usually do these microwave circuits at low temperatures? Well, I would say this kind of C band or X band, whatever your microwave jargon is for the sort of four to 12 gigahertz range, it's basically the coldest, uh, the lowest frequencies that are still quantum at the coldest temperatures that are readily achievable. So just to be more specific, down below 100 millikelvin, you can have your microwave fields really in their ground state. And it's in that sense that you can really finally talk about quantum optics of microwave photons. And again, this is nothing unique to our group. This is just setting the stage. And as I said, using that resource, we're going to try to connect to other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, other parts of the hybrid quantum technology. So the group is more than just myself specifically. Uh, there's a group leader, Joe Amentado, another PI, Ray Simmons, a number of senior researchers seen here. And broadly speaking, uh, our, our lab has three basic themes. One is really that of superconducting circuits. And here I'm talking about Joseph's injunctions, typical transmons. Uh, there's some beautiful work being led by Ray Simmons right now on ultra fast, high fidelity parametric gates, really trying to solve the problem of, of getting as much fidelity as you possibly can given a certain coherence. On the other end of the spectrum, we make things that are not nonlinear at the single photon level, but still use the Josephson nonlinearity. And these are things you should have in mind, like Josephson parametric amplifiers, or more recently, we're using these as parametric circulators or directional amplifiers, or really entangling circuits, the kind of linear quantum optics you can do with dual mode squeezing or beam splitter Hamiltonians. And that's a mature uh, field that we're working both as deployable technology just to make lower noise amplifiers, but also thinking about novel ways to really innovate and integrate specifically with the qubits and other quantum circuits. And the last thrust is the circuit optomechanics. If any of you tuned in last week, you heard a talk from Shlomi Kotler, who was a postdoc in our group before moving on to the Hebrew University. This is something really near and dear to my heart. It's not gonna be the theme of my talk, but I will come back to it a little bit at the end. The idea is of quantum MEMS using your control of microwave photonics to do really quantum acoustics or quantum phononics. And accessing that degree of freedom, again, has lots of pros and cons, and it's a fun playground for just quantum circuits. So the big idea I want to talk about is not something new this seminar. The ideas of what you need to do to build a quantum computer. I've listed over here the DiVincenzo criteria that many of you know and love. Now, superconducting circuits have long been uh, both an ideal candidate for these things, but have really been checking off all of these boxes. I apologize to my IBM host for showing, uh, you know, Google circuits as my canonical example, but the ideas are really uh, a lot of the same at the heart. We're going to operate at low temperature. That's going to give us initialization of these microwave circuits. They're going to be naturally very close to their ground state. Uh, the progress and the unknown kind of 20 years ago was the coherence. And that's what's really moved unbelievably in the past couple decades. That's really now allowing people to do many, many operations in a coherence time. The gates were part of the strong point from the beginning. These are circuits you can couple to as strongly as you want. And most of our lives are spent trying to couple more weakly, uh, not accidentally coupling strongly to these things. And the measurements, Again, the advent of Josephson parametric amplifiers has really pushed the microwave readout to very close to the fundamental quantum limits. The irony here is the last DiVincenzo criteria is scalability. 
And from day one, that was supposed to be the strength of superconducting circuits. So in fact, if you, if you were to look at PR photos of various superconducting quantum circuits, you see these beautiful nanofabricated chips that are dense integrated circuits with many, many qubits, readout resonators, everything on that chip, compact and highly scalable. But then if you keep scrolling down on the web page, the other publicity photos you'll see are these chandeliers, these rat nests of wiring. And it's that wiring that is becoming a bottleneck. And it's not because no one has thought about it. It's, in my opinion, because the superconducting circuits themselves have made such rapid, unbelievable progress. But as you notice, looking at these pictures, most of what you're looking at is the inside of a dilution refrigerator cryostat to get to these cryogenic temperatures. But then it's just coax cables, filters, circulators. It's all the classical infrastructure. And again, the fact that classical infrastructure is becoming a bottleneck, uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful curse and a blessing. And so what I'm going to talk about are some novel ideas of addressing this, how to scale beyond these kind of packed dilution refrigerators that you see here. So again, some just a recent snapshot that, that of kind of where the state of the art is. People are at of order 100 qubits. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not up to speed on the latest and the greatest, but that's the order of magnitude. And again, if you're just looking at the number of control lines, well, you need to control these superconducting qubits with microwave pulses. And so you send them down heavily shielded and filtered coaxial cables. Now, if you just look at the brute force scaling, doing everything exactly like you do, there's a clear path to, pardon me, to about a thousand qubits. And that's not to say nobody knows how to go beyond a thousand qubits, but people are gonna start having to pull tricks out of their bag. And I'll go through a lot of those tricks. Those are the things that are going to let us get beyond a thousand, but how far past a thousand is really an open question. And the idea to have in mind is really for error protection, for, for doing fault tolerant quantum computing. You want many, many, many extra qubits to do your quantum error correction, to do your redundancy. And that, if you can do at the large number of qubits at the high fidelity level, is what's really going to deliver on the full quantum promise, promise of quantum computing technology. So what are some of the ways that people are thinking about this scalability challenge? Well, uh, here's a nice picture from IBM. The first thing you can do is you can just build bigger fridges. Uh, there's nothing fundamental there. You can throw money, size, and engineering at it, and you can get the scale larger and larger. And these things will always help. Uh, that's not to say uh, that you will get all the way to a million with it, but this is the next logical step. This is not gonna keep people from sitting around on their hands uh, just for the next couple of years. There's plenty to do there, but you can see the size and the scale you're starting to have just for the sheer cryogenics. And most of the cryogenics is not cooling the chip, it's cooling the stuff around it, the classical infrastructure. Other things people are certainly looking at is connect up two different DIL fridges. Uh, one of the technologies I show here are microwave to optical converters, where maybe you can get your quantum information onto a fiber, send it over to somebody else's DIL fridge and link up your DIL fridges into a quantum network or maybe a local area network. And there's work not just out of Jilla that I showed before, things out of uh, Caltech and now Amazon, uh, really trying to combine these hybrid quantum technologies, trying to get qubits talking to optical photons for some of the reasons that I'll discuss. One of the pros about optical photons is their ability to be a robust quantum technology, even at room temperature. I also wanna highlight, it's not crazy to link these things up quantum coherently, even in the microwave regime. You can basically connect with waveguides or transmission lines, and there's work, uh, uh, actually quite a bit of work in Europe, really showing that you can make links between two separate DIL fridges. So this helps the scaling again by the kind of double the size, but not the orders of magnitude that we're really after. Now, obviously the coax cables that I showed, there's nothing fundamental there. You can start to use skinnier and skinnier coax or there's lots of research into a uh, kind of shielded ribbon cable like I've shown here. This higher density wiring, again, this is scratching the right itch. This is an active area that people are thinking about and implementing. But again, with that technology, even if you can get your signals down, you still worry about things like, is it as shielded? Did it let noise in? Is there other processes that corrupt the beautiful environment of the qubits? And the last thing I'll talk about are people are really trying to put control electronics directly in their dilution refrigerators, trying to see if maybe you don't have to go all the way up to room temperature. 
Uh, and that's certainly an active area of research. So today, the idea that I'm going to talk about, the alternative to what I show you on the left of taking your microwave signals, sending them down heavily filtered and attenuated coaxial lines to your superconducting qubits, is to do this photonically. And again, what I'm going to show here is a canonical RF photonic link. This is nothing new. We did not invent an RF photonic link. This is used all the time in telecommunications in industry. And the idea is really pretty simple. You use optical carriers to carry your microwave signals. So you encode microwaves as amplitude modulation of an optical carrier, just with a commercial EOM. Now the novelty, the thing we're gonna try, is to send that in down an optical fiber and directly to the 10 millikelvin environment. And reconstitute this optical microwave signal with fast photodiodes directly at the base temperature of a dilution refrigerator and see if we can use that to drive our quantum circuits. Uh, this is our attempt to address the problem, to look at the pros and cons, and really to explore this as preliminary research. Again, one of the themes, we're very excited about this. I don't want to pretend this is a solved problem or that everybody should just throw out their coax cables and move on immediately. But these alternatives and ones like it are very much what I would encourage uh, the field to think about. And at the beginning of this work, there were really questions that are great. They range all the way from the simplest. Does it freaking work at all? Do these things, uh, what do they do at low temperatures? Is it known? What are the secrets? And then if those things are a yes, no, or maybe you can start to think about, well, then can you take advantages of all the pros that you'd want from RS Photonics? Namely, is it scalable? So what are the reasons that it would be great? Well, the reasons are pretty self-evident. Uh, RF photonics links, you have full vector control. You can take vector microwaves, encode them on an optical carrier and reconstitute full amplitude and phase. There's very high intrinsic bandwidth, both to the modulators, the photodiodes, and certainly the fibers themselves with many, many terahertz of bandwidth. Optical wavelengths are compact, certainly much more than the microwave regime. Uh, the optical fiber, has many, many billions of dollars in man hours spent in really optimizing how low loss it can be. And that is good, not just because we're trying to go over kilometer distance for communication someday. Here, it's useful as a classical technology of not dissipating in our fridge. Lastly, because it's just a dielectric fiber, it's intrinsically low thermal conductivity. So it really helps compared to a metal coaxial cable from how much heat load you put on your delicate base temperature of your cryostat. And the last thing are these these things are becoming more and more low cost, again, leveraging off of much of the uh, classical technology. And all of these things together are why we think it might be a scalable way to wire your dilution refrigerator. So that's why it could be great. Uh, let me also point out why this is a horrible idea, why your skin should really crawl when somebody says this in the first place. They should look you right in the eyes and say, what the hell are you doing? You've made the coldest, darkest, quietest environment in the universe at the bottom of your Dell fridge, and you're going to pipe down a beautiful transmission line that can deliver high energy, hot optical photons. So you would worry naively just about strict heating, just sheer dissipation, heating things up beyond your base temperature. But superconducting circuits are also notoriously uh, incompatible with photonics, meaning superconductors don't look very super at optical frequencies. Uh, there's no better example than this than my colleagues at NIST who make beautiful single photon detectors out of these things, exactly because optical photons have so much energy, they can easily break not just a single Cooper pair, but many Cooper pairs. Lastly, you could worry that this corrupts your shielded environment. This lets in extraneous noise, and maybe even the, the microwave signals coming down, They well, you get your signal down, but you get excess noise at the frequencies you care about. And as we all know, our readout cavities and our superconducting qubits, they care about noise about as much as any circuit in the universe. So before I delve into it, I'm gonna start with a simple example and maybe walk through a thing that's, that's trivial but kind of beautiful. And that is, how do you get microwave coherent states in the first place? What is it that we all do? And the thing that we do is, is we take very nice mature signal generators at room temperature that can make very large sine waves with you know, plus 10 dBm, plus 20 dBm of power. So in this kind of ball and stick picture of quantum optics, the idea is what you have is displaced states. And because it's room temperatures where the microwaves are not in their ground state, these are strictly speaking in the language of quantum optics, displaced thermal states. 
Now the beauty and what you have is you really have immense signal to noise. This is not at all drawn to scale. If you really had milliwatts of microwave power, uh, I can do the math almost off the top of my head. You're probably talking about something like 10 to the 20 photons per second. Uh, so this lever arm is really, really huge. The intrinsic ball here is set by KT, which at microwave frequencies is thousands of quanta. So you're far from the quantum limit, but the idea is you have signal to noise to spare. So you send this through cold beam splitters and the cold beam splitters, they get rid of your signal, but they get rid of your noise. And in the end, if you do it right, if you have enough cold attenuation, what you get is a much smaller lever arm. Your coherent state is much lower, but it really is a coherent state. It really is vacuum noise that's setting this thing. And this is the concept of sacrificing signal to noise to achieve, achieve pure, coherent states at the bottom of your dilution refrigerator. And what was interesting to me to think about in the first place is this RF photonic link. Well, do I need cold microwave attenuators? So again, what I'm going to do is just encode my microwaves. I'm going to take this same generator and I'm going to modulate a laser at 10 gigahertz. So I'm just going to turn it on and off coherently at 10 gigahertz. That signal is going to go down an optical fiber. And what's nice, again, our colleagues in the time and frequency division, they have worked on this technology and it has beautiful dynamic range. And this is dynamic range, not just of the lasers and the modulators, but every component involved. And they too can have this enormous signal to noise such that when you reconstitute it down with a cryogenic diode and you mix this optical carrier with these 10 gigahertz amplitude modulation sidebands, you can get beautiful coherent states at the bottom of your dilution refrigerator. And if I had to say it in a, in a pithy way, I would say optical attenuation is already cold. There's no need for cryogenic microwave attenuators. So that's one of the pros in thinking about these things. I don't intentionally have to dissipate uh, any of this delicate microwave power. So again, some of the first things we just wanted to see is does this work at all? So what I'm gonna show here on the left is just a frequency domain cartoon to keep track of the ideas. We're gonna have an optical carrier. Here, we're gonna use something at 1490. Uh, again, uh, ideally, we'd like to push to working exactly at telecom frequencies. This is where our photodiode happened to work best. Just using a room temperature EOM, electro-optic modulator, you can have these 10 gigahertz or so sidebands. Intrinsically, you can do this much, much faster. People push up to 100 gigahertz if they want. And uh, the idea is, that's just something that is people have worked on. And then once this goes into the photodiode, well, your carrier goes to DC and these sidebands are now the signal. That's now our microwave source directly emitting the power at the millikelvin stage. What we wanted to do after we saw that this works at all is go ahead and try to drive a quantum circuit. And that's not just because that's the driving application. It's also, as I mentioned before, Qubits are the most brutal uh, kind of measuring devices I know. If you can drive a qubit, I would say uh, you can know everything about your system. You can use it to infer if things are good, bad, somewhere in between. So for this, we're going to use a canonical 3D transpon, uh, just like what was developed at Yale maybe a decade ago uh, as our kind of uh, standard circuit and see what we can do with these photonic sources. So before I go into the details there, Maybe I'll just look back at Zlatko and see if there's any questions or if I can pause for a minute to answer anything. Yeah, maybe a couple of quick uh, quick questions. Uh, what, what about infrared photons from room temperature kind of sneaking down the optical fibers or do those not really propagate at all? Uh... I, so let's see, I would say we're not, the fiber can allow transmission uh, right now these things shouldn't transfer well through the photodiode packaging to our device, but these are absolutely things to worry about. So far, what I can say is it has not been a problem. When we're not sending light down, there appears to be no light on our device that we can measure. As we really push to integrating tighter and more and maybe getting less and less middlemen between the photodiode and the qubit, I think that continues to be an important question that we'll keep track of. But my my short answer is so far so good. I see. And I guess part of that is the optical fibers outside the, the box housing the, the quantum circuit. That's right. Uh, 
And so right now the fiber goes into the photodiode in its own ha housing. That gets connected with the coaxial cable at 10 millikelvin to our qubit. Uh, and so, you know, those all those middlemen in the way, they help to block, you know, stray light uh, that would get from one to another. Got it. And, and have you maybe noticed difference in the dark counts of the photo detectors with the optical fiber in place than, than perhaps without? Uh, let's see. Uh, dark counts of the photodiode itself is what you're asking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so certainly when we get these things cold, the dark counts really tank. I mean, it really, uh, what is nice is when there's no intentional optical power, it seems like the dark counts are very, very low. Uh, we haven't pushed to the limits to ask what has them, but it again, it's it's order of magnitude normal, uh, lower than that you would normally have at room temperature. Uh, again, mostly just because uh, the properties of the photodiode are getting better, both in any stray leakage current and probably in terms of excess photons, which may generate dark, uh, real dark counts. Okay, thank you, John. And from Mahid, quick question on, could you just tell us a little more about the photodiode? Uh, how did you choose this type of photodiode as opposed to MKIDs or S and SPDs or TES and so on, TS? Sure. Uh, so the idea of what you really need here is you need a diode that has a very fast uh, response function. Um, and uh, unlike some of the other technologies that you mentioned, we're not trying to get a click detector. This is not something that's like counting the optical photons or they that can just tell the click. We're really using this more as an optical mixer. So the idea with these photodiodes is they have the bandwidth to reconstitute, reconstitute signals basically from DC to 20 gigahertz. But exactly which technology we used we did just try some, some worked, some didn't. Uh, understanding and looking at some of these, uh, we've by no means done exhaustive results. Uh, most of what I would say is this is kind of a beautiful proof of principle. Here's at least one that works really well. And we're absolutely looking at other technologies to see if they're better, worse, or the same. Mm -hmm. Great, and maybe find, there's, there's actually a bunch more questions. Uh, let's just take one more now and maybe the rest we can save for a little bit later. Uh, so, what about infrared photon shot noise? Are you planning to mitigate that? I let's see. I, again, in the experiments that we have, if we turn the laser off, we really see no uh, bad effects of excess photons or anything from the perspective of the qubit or the readout cavity. And that's what I'll get to a little bit. Now, when we do turn the laser on you have absolutely have to worry about the optical shot noise of that carrier. And that's also something I'll talk about, but uh, I'll kind of separate those things. And then I'll reiterate the caveat that I have as we push to higher efficiency or maybe more integrated packaging, really getting the fibers themselves closer to the delicate qubits. I think we are gonna have to continue to work and think about these things and, and worry about them again. Got it. And maybe just tie that off. Uh, how does the optical fiber couple to the photo detector? I, let's see, uh, we did some uh, initial work where we kind of packaged it ourselves, where we really uh, glued a fiber to a lens on the outside of a standard uh, sample holder. Uh, the one that we used in this work was uh, actually a commercially packaged one with, again, uh, using their commercial techniques of, uh, I, I have guesses of what they did inside the package, but I'm, I, I confess I'm not positive. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, John. There are, I'm sorry, we're, be one get to all the questions right now, but we're going to get to them at the end. So just remember them and repost them as we get to the uh, when we get to the end of the talk, or maybe before that in the next break of questions. Thank you, John. Sure, I'll try to speed up to leave leave time for the interesting conversation, not for my uh, monologue. Oh, this is great. Please, please go on. So again, the idea here is we're going to take a standard 3D transmon. The 3D transmon basically has two degrees of freedom. There's what's going on at the qubit frequency and what's going on at the cavity frequency. In our particular device, the architecture we used, our qubit is at five gigahertz, our cavity is at 11 gigahertz. And what we wanted to do is separately characterize, use the photodiode to use, generate the microwave tone that we use for the readout cavity, look at the pros and cons and see how that works. And then we're gonna separately connect our photodiode to the qubit drive at five gigahertz see if we can drive Robbie oscillations. Are they any good, what we have there? So I'll walk through those two separate experiments. And in principle, on a large dream of scaling, you would have individual photo to do these various things. 
So again, uh, I'm sure this is completely redundant, so I'll go very quickly for uh, a KISKID audience. This is canonical circuit QED, the readout of the state of the superconducting qubit, whether it's in a state zero or one, is just encoded as the phase shift of a cavity. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a very weak coherent state, maybe of about 10 photons in this superconducting cavity at 11 gigahertz. And we're gonna look to see if it's shifted by a couple of megahertz, depending on the state of the qubit. And this is just the standard dispersive strong coupling regime. Now, the first thing we can do is see whether or not we can do this readout. And again, in this particular experiment, we're gonna do our qubits drives with regular coaxial lines, and we're doing our cavity readout with a microwave tone that's generated by our photodiode. Just to get a sense of scale, as I said, at the reference plane of the cavity, internal to the cavity, you're talking about 10 photons, a kind of typical readout power that's still in the QND regime for the dispersive strong coupling. Uh, as far as a microwave power for maybe those coming from a photodiode perspective or are not up to speed, powers are about minus 120 dBm. So again, from a telecom uh, community, this is insanely zero power. This is nothing like what these photodiodes were designed to handle. So the first thing we can do is our fiducial measurement. We can do everything using coaxial lines, both our cavity readout and our qubit drive, and we can just look at our histograms, by which I mean prepare the ground state and try to measure the ground state. Prepare the excited state and measure the excited state. And here, the fact that you were plotting it on a log scale, you can already see we're doing pretty well. For our particular device, uh, what I wanna say is we repeat that same experiment now where our microwave cavity drive was generated by sending kind of 10 nanowatts of optical power down an optical fiber, modulated so that it generates a microwave signal, and we repeat the same measurement. Now, if you just look at these side by side, you'll see hopefully what I want you to see, they're basically the same, meaning to the ability to measure, uh, we really see that they have the same readout fidelity of about 98%. I wanna stress this is not fully optimized, this is the fidelity of we measure with this qubit in separate experiments, um, kind of uh, not record breaking, but uh, fully on par with kind of our gate times and our coherence times of this device. And to the level that we're seeing with this coherence qubit, we can't resolve any badness in the fidelity of our single shot readout. So that's a good thing. Again, that's not a trivial statement. You can imagine all sorts of excess noise or badness coming down this optical fiber. First of all, just breaking the superconductivity at all, that's not happening, but also not even giving excess noise that uh, corrupts the delicate coherent state you're using for the readout. And quick question on that. Um, if you keep the laser, say, on, uh, I guess maybe here it's pulsed. Um, have you seen any temperature changes in the qubit population? Let's see. Uh, for these powers, that's something we can leave on, and it's perfectly fine. Both the, the fridge happily stays cold and the qubit in the cavity stay cold, again, to the level that we can measure. Uh, for some of the things that I'll show later where we really crank up the power, uh, there you, you can worry about dissipating power and then things can heat up. And in those cases, we absolutely do move to pulse measurements uh, just to keep the average heat load very, very small. And again, the pulsing, uh, luckily, that's that's very compatible with this optical technology. Everything about that has intrinsically more than enough bandwidth for such things. Great, thank you. Sure. So what about the qubit coherence itself? So to look at those sorts of things, what you can worry about is the 3D transmon could be affected by, as I said, non-equilibrium quasi-particles. These quasi-particles could affect your T1 of your qubit. So if we measure our T1, again, we're using a, what I would call a standard 3D transmon. In our lab, we measure T1s of around 40 something microseconds and not claiming to be record breaking, something we're very happy with. And there's nothing special about this device. Uh, I, and what we were looking at, I think is a little bit about what you were asking is like, oh, does it change, for example, if I have the optical power on or not? And here we showed with just having two microwatts of optical power on, uh, not delivering any microwave signals, just this optical power on to see if it's doing badness. You know, and at the very least, you could worry about, you know, breaking quasi-particles or heating up your fridge. Uh, like everyone in the field, our T1 is a little bit of a, a noisy quantity. Uh, here we plot a histogram 
And roughly again, what we see in these two histograms of kind of measuring when we measure with no optical power or with even two microwatts of optical power, essentially they're the same to our ability to measure. And absolutely future research would be to uh, get even more coherent systems, get some of the best in the field, the, the not 40 microsecond, but the 400 microsecond devices, the most sensitive devices we as a field know how to make and see if these levels still pass that bar. But this is basically what we're saying. The qubit is seeing no stray optical light. And it's not seeing even stray optical light, even when we put a lot of optical power down this fiber intentionally. So that's a good sign. So the next thing you can also think about, well, maybe if there's excess microwave noise in the readout cavity, well, that could affect the dephasing. And to look at the dephasing, you can do just uh, look at your Ramsey fringes. And again, what I'm showing here is just uh, uh, our Ramsey oscillations, either doing the traditional coaxial approach or the photonic link. And again, the data is kind of boring because the answer is the curves look essentially the same to the level at which we can measure. In both cases, we have a relatively good T2 of order or T1, again, around 40 microseconds, and we see no resolvable difference with or without the photonic link. So again, uh, the T2 is not affected, and that means the noise, we are able to turn off the lights when we want to turn off the lights, and that is definitely a good thing. One of the things we worried about in the beginning. So now we're going to switch cases. Now we're going to connect uh, our photonic link, not to the cavity at 11 gigahertz, but we're going to have it generate a 5 gigahertz signal to see if we can drive Rabi oscillations, and if so, what they look like. So again, for our Rabi oscillations, what's nice is we can do our fiducial measurement, again, doing relatively fast Rabi oscillations of just maybe tens of nanoseconds, something that's really pushing the limits of the anharmonicity of the transmon itself. Uh, and we can do this again now with uh, our optically reconstituted microwave signal. And here we have a microwave photo current about four microamps, just to give people a sense of scale, an ideal responsivity, the, the way you go back and forth between optical power and microwave current is roughly just using uh, uh, the optical photon energy. So it would be about, uh, pardon me, almost one to one, one micro of power would give you one microamp of current is the rough scale that you have here. I, the idea and what we were excited to see is to look in depth at these Rabi oscillations to do all the cross checks that you'd want. So here we plot the canonical Rabi oscillation, the Rabi frequency versus the drive amplitude to see that it does in fact scale linearly. And in fact, as I said, we can push even where it starts to break down from that linearity. Again, just from the fact that the transmon is not an intrinsic two level system, there are higher levels. So we see this bending over that agrees very much with theory. And it is exactly the same for coaxial or photonic approach. And this is a part that was not trivial. Again, here we had to use relatively high optical powers, and it's nice to see that our cryogenic photonic link is compatible and can deliver just enough juice to drive Rabi oscillations even through the cavity filtering that's intrinsically there. So uh, low noise, check. No straight light, check. And it can deliver sufficient enough power and again, the thing that takes the most power is really doing the fast gates, doing the fast Rabi oscillations. So now, now that we've shown it works, you know, as an intrinsic guy who loves noise deep in his soul, part of what you can do is turn the experiment on its ear. You can say, now let's use our qubit as our delicate sensor of the light. Let's use it to fend, measure the fundamental or excess noise properties of this cryogenic photonic link. Uh, so one of the things that we can look at is, again, look at the noise at the cavity frequency. Uh, any excess noise there will lead to qubit dephasing. We can measure that qubit dephasing as a function of our optical power, and we can really see if we have the fundamental noise that has to be there. But, so again, to look at qubit dephasing, what you can do is just Ramsey sequences. And now what we're going to do over and over is basically measure our T2. From our T2, you can invert that through ways people know to characterize it as basically an, an average cavity occupancy of noise in your cavity. How cold or quiet is your cavity? 
And we're going to do this as a function of optical power, or here I plot it as photo current. Now, when we turn our lights off, we have noise at the 10 to the minus 2 level. Again, this is kind of typical for our experiments. There are, of course, many, many uh, better numbers in the field where you can do better with some more filtering and shielding and shielding and filtering. But this 10 to the minus 2 level is basically the baseline of our measurements. And then we're looking for the noise that we know must be there. And specifically, that's because the optical light is quantized. The optical photons have Poisson statistics in their arrival times. If you increase your average power, there has to generate shot noise fundamentally. And what is nice and what we're excited to see is we see exactly this linear dependence, saying the noise that we see here is what we'd expect. And I'll stress again, that's the noise that has to be there. We could new, do no better than that. We can try to measure this same kind of optical shot noise, not from a perspective of dephasing, but actually look for noise at the qubit frequency, look for population in the excited state when it wasn't supposed to be there. And again, for these measurements, if you plot, what's the probability to be found in the ground state uh, as a function of optical of power? Again, we have some baseline. We start uh, down at about 10%. And then as we increase the current or the optical power on a log scale, we can see this linear dependence. So these are two manifestations really showing the fundamental shot noise of the optical photons. If you take both of those same data and you really reduce it and you turn this into a photodiode measurement, you compare this to what you'd measure with, you know, your trans impedance amplifier or what have you, uh, you can really plot, plot this noise in amp squared per hertz and you can see it really scales as 2EI, the fundamental noise that you'd expect. And what we're excited about here is not just because this, of course, could have been much worse. There could be many mechanisms for mesoscopic noise, but also that this noise is kind of fundamental. This allows us to step back and, and really do calculations about how it would scale. Because now we can say this really would behave exactly as we'd expect. And those kind of assumptions were non-trivial when we started these projects. So back to our, our first and last questions, does it work at all? Uh, yes, Whew. otherwise I, I don't think I'd be here talking about it today. And now we can start to think about, will it scale? So uh, let me step back and think about scaling in general. What is the bottleneck for scaling just with traditional coaxial lines? Let's take a typical Dell fridge with maybe 20 microwatts of cooling power at around 20 millikelvin. Again, these numbers you should take with a grain of salt or an order of magnitude depends on the fridge or the setup. Now, roughly, the number of qubits you can drive is just a ratio of the cooling power that you have versus the heat load for everything you're going to do. Now, for coaxial cable, the dominant heat load is just a passive heat load. It's the fact that you took some piece of metal and you connected your cold temperatures to your hot temperatures. And you do your vitamin fronds and you calculate, and there's really works of not just calculating that, but measuring these things. What you can find is coax cable has a heat load of around 14 nanowatts per cable. And so what I'm going to start to plot here on the right are the number of qubits you could possibly wire up, again, with these traditional coax cables and a traditional fridge. And this is what's giving us the number of about around 1,000. Just the heat load of having those metal connections is going to be a problem. Now, fiber is like three or four or magnitude less, both because it's physically thinner and because it's dielectric. It's not a metal. And you get to take advantage of the T cubed of the phonons and the thermal conductivity. So you have intrinsically picowatts of power. And that puts the passive heat load for the fiber way up here, above a million. And I'm not going to emphasize this too much because this is not going to be the bottleneck, as you'll see in a second. Now you have to ask about the active heat load. Well, for the coax cable, most of it is the cold attenuators. If you have a 30 dB attenuator at your mixing chamber, well, you have to dissipate basically a thousand times as much power as you take to drive your qubits. But even that's not so bad, it's pretty negligible. For the optical photonic link, the photons are really being dissipated in the photodiode. So your optical power is giving you a real heat load. So now if you were to compare the real total, the passive and active, well, for the coax, these two numbers are about the same. For the fiber, it's quite different. And it's this active heat load that you really have to think about. And here's where we get back to exactly what Zlatko asked about earlier. Well, could you just pulse your optical power, or maybe work at a lower duty cycle? And the answer is yes. And so here's a scale depending on the duty cycle of how much of the time, really wall clock time that you have your optical power on. That's something that if you do keep it on for about 1% of the time, you're around the break even part. 
if you can sacrifice just doing slower uh, sequences or slower repetition rates, maybe this could get you to 10 to the four or 10 to the five qubits. There's a last thing that I'll say, and that's that the photo diet itself is intrinsically not a 50 ohm source. We've thought about, and again, this is in the references of the paper, some clever ideas to maybe move away from 50 ohms that can win us another order of magnitude. But these are speculations and ideas that are, what are the path to get up here toward a million? And that's what we're excited about here, is that there is a path. So uh, one of the things, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, qubits themselves are not 50 ohms, and photodiodes themselves are not 50 ohms. What can we do here? How should I think about the photodiode? Well, basically, the light comes in and makes a photo current. So from a microwave engineering perspective, you should think of it as a stiff current source. Now, when we're driving qubits and resonators, we usually have a weak coupling capacitor on the input intentionally because we don't want to directly galvanically connect these things to 50 ohms. They would have a Q of five or whatever it is. So these coupling capacitors means we're driving essentially an open circuit. So a fun thing to ask is, well, what happens when a current source drives an open circuit? Uh, the answer is you find out who's lying. Uh, either your current source isn't a perfect current source or your open circuit isn't really open. And in practice, all these things have real admittances to them based on what you're doing. The ideas we're gonna have in the work I showed, we really connected with 50 ohm devices, 50 ohm filters and circulators and things to make sure everything was well controlled. Looking beyond the future, what we'd like to do is see if maybe we can efficiently connect a high impedance source to the qubits directly. And since the microwave power, you can really think of it as an I squared Z, where Z is basically the impedance of this environment that you're driving. If your impedance is higher or higher, you get more microwaves power for a given photo current. And that's the idea of pushing from 50 ohms to maybe a kilo ohm, maybe 10 kilo ohms. At that point, it becomes an engineering problem of trying to figure out how you connect, how you don't get reflections, what you have. The fundamental limits I'll emphasize are really more about the loss tangents of the photodiode. And those are things that could be quite good. There are just good capacitors and we're operating at low temperatures. And that's part of the future research that we're interested in looking at. But in the other future directions, you can ask uh, on one of the most fruitful things is just say other, other optical technology that would be useful cryogenically. A lot of that's how superconducting qubits started is people just tried to buy microwave things and try them cold and see what worked and go from there. I think optical technology is going through a similar renaissance and especially in the light of these things. I wanna highlight some other work that came out of the Kipping group. Similarly, they were asking a reciprocal question. Can you use a cryogenic EOM to read out microwaves cryogenically? Now they did this not at the base temperature, but up at higher temperatures and this picture that I'm showing here was from a news and views that talked about that work and ours. And this is kind of the dream. Maybe you could wire your whole dill fridge with only fibers going into your fridge, no coaxial cables at all. And everything you do is reconstituted, reconstituted from optical carriers. I'll also say there's a plethora of optical multiplexing uh, things that you can in principle take advantage of. And the grand dream might be just sending down a highly multiplex optical fiber with many, many signals per fiber. And some of the things we're really looking at, what is the ultimate limit to this power efficiency? Some of those are the things like possibly using high impedance driving, but also looking at more dispersive technology instead of straight photodiodes. Uh, so let's see, I have a second part to my talk, but maybe it's better to stop there and ask for questions. And if there's a couple of things, maybe I'll just touch on briefly, but I wanna make sure uh, uh, maybe I open it up to some other questions at this time as I'm wrapping yeah, up this lecture. Yeah, that's good. And folks, feel free to post some questions as we go along uh, here and uh, keep them in the queue. But I think maybe at this stage, let's proceed with the next step uh, and then we can take everything at the end. Sounds great. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. As I said in the very beginning, this is the story of using uh, optical frequencies for superconducting quantum technology. And now I'm just going to highlight again using back some of these other frequencies. Uh, some of this, uh, I encourage people to go back and watch the YouTube video from last week's Kiss Kit seminar by Shlomi Kotler. He talked in depth about some of it, and I'm just going to highlight it here. The heart and soul is asking, what if you can take RF kind of megahertz mechanical systems and use them for quantum control and hybrid quantum circuits? 
So this is a false color SEM of devices we make in our clean room. It's a sapphire substrate with aluminum. Again, the same kind of compatible technologies that we use for transmons and things. And the innovation is hovering this top plate of a capacitor, maybe tens of nanometers above a counter electrode. And that means as it vibrates up and down, you can couple to your system. Now, why use these mechanical circuits? Uh, what's nice about mechanics is, well, they're low frequency and high Q, so that gives you naturally long lifetimes. The thing you're looking at here has lifetime of maybe intrinsically tens of milliseconds. And in the field, people are now pushing those up to seconds or tens of seconds. The mechanical cues are really off the charts because again, it's a separate mature field. The other great thing about these mechanical systems is their linearity and dynamic range. And the last thing I'll say is they're kind of universal. Universal in that you can figure out how to couple to almost anything you want because you just have to figure out a way to push on this with some force. Now to compare and contrast, mechanical resonators to their RF analogs. I love looking at this picture from CERN. Again, this is what a, a 20 megahertz kind of lambda over two pillbox resonator looks like. And the wavelength, as you can see, not surprisingly, is the size of a human. And so this mechanical drum, which you can think of that as a circular membrane vibrating with a fundamental lambda over two mode, you can almost read off the wavelength of 10 microns as compared to a meter. And that's what's seeing the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound. The fact that speed of sound is slow is what gives us this compactness. And that's one of the highlights of why mechanics in the first place. Again, if you're familiar with the field of op cavity optic mechanics, these beautiful mechanical systems we now know how to couple to and read out dispersively just by making them a boundary condition. So here's a canonical fabry perot resonator at optical frequencies with a mechanically compliant boundary condition. As it moves back and forth, say at 10 megahertz, it will phase modulate your light and you get encoded as phase modulation sidebands. And you can get a very sensitive readout very close to quantum limits. We can of course do the electromechanical analog. Instead of using these optical things, we can use our favorite microwave circuits where now a capacitor, an inductor capacitor circuit is vibrating. And that also gives you phase amp modulation and it gives you the same Hamiltonian. That radiation pressure in Hamiltonian is basically exactly what I said. You couple the position of the mechanical harmonic oscillator to a force, and that force is the radiation pressure force where the A dagger A here is the number of photons in the cavity. This is the same physics that's used in everything from LIGO to AFMs that really reaches the gamut in these things. And it's this all the same in Hamiltonian. Now, just like in circuit QED, the figure of merit is not one constant or the other. The kind of dimensionless rate that you would put in this problem, the G not this bare uh, vacuum coupling rate is the thing that we're always after and what we optimize. And in the field of cavity optomechanics, I think it's fair to say almost all the innovations in the past 10 years have come from innovations in getting this coupling rate larger and larger by engineering better transduction factors, making cavities that move more per unit motion and making floppier or larger zero point motion mechanical oscillators. So how do I think about this fundamental coupling rate and these two things? Well, again, in the optical regime, this coupling rate is basically scaled by your cavity frequency. And then it's a ratio of these length scales, the zero point motion of the oscillator to the length of the cavity. In the circuits, you can look up in Berginsky's book, literally writing the book on quantum measurement from the 1980s, you can find a very similar plausible formula you're now setting the scale with a microwave frequency, which is much lower by about three orders of magnitude, maybe four. But crucially, the characteristic length scale is the plates of these uh, between your capacitors. And that's where we win it back in our electromechanical circuits. That's our secret sauce is making this as sub wavelength and as lump circuit as humanly possible. So again, for these devices, these are things that are vibrating with zero point motion of order of nuclear distance. You're talking a few femtometers. And surprisingly, that's something we can kind of not easily resolve, but straightforwardly resolve with state of the art technology. These circuits have been good to us. I won't go into detail on these things. We did some first demonstrations of ground state cooling, done quantum state transfer. We are NIST, so we use these things for sensing both in force and displacement. Microwave networking is one of the, the applications where you can couple two frequencies. You can do frequency conversion. You can do this reciprocally. 
non-reciprocally, and as we heard last week, you can even use entanglement. We can even push into the field of quantum enhanced sensing. So the one of the most driving applications that I want to explain just a little bit briefly with the last couple of minutes is that of microwave to optical transduction. Surprisingly, if you want to quantum coherently connect the microwave and optical regime, the best way to currently do it is to convert your microwaves down to a 10 megahertz mechanical mode and then up convert that up to optical frequencies. Again, these are things that are spearheaded by my colleagues across the street at Jilla, uh, really the optical expertise of Sydney Regal and the microwave expertise of Conrad Leonard. Uh, at NIST, we are leveraging some of this technology to think about the next steps. Think about how you'd really use a transducer to like that to quantum coherently connect two dilution refrigerators. And this is expertise across the fields, really in the optical technologies, in the theory components from people like Scott Glancy and Manny Neal. I, with just the last couple of minutes, what I'll also say is I presented these two regimes of quantum technology. We have the microwave circuits that we know both for the optomechanical systems and for circuit QED. On the other hand, there's a plethora of quantum technology in the optics here at wavelengths of hundreds of nanometers up to a micron. But there's this quantum desert in between. There's all of this room of untapped space and part of the questions we're starting to ask is, can we get the best of both worlds? Can we get the ultra small load volumes and the nonlinearities of superconducting circuits combined with the stronger forces or higher energies of higher frequency photons? And so for that, we're gonna take the baby steps, maybe to move from four gigahertz by an order of magnitude up to around 40 gigahertz into the K band or into the millimeter wave regime. Now the millimeter waves are not, we're not the first people to do this. You know, most notably, all the beautiful Nobel Prize winning work out of Soroch's group, the textbook of quantum optics, what people forget are his optics were 50 gigahertz microwave photons in those cases. And again, that's the go-to. I'll also highlight there's, there's work in the past couple of years, uh, both out of Chicago and out of Stanford, with the ideas of coupling to Rydberg atoms or in some of this transduction technology of, again, pushing circuits and superconducting devices up towards 100 gigahertz. The other thing I like to point out is a little bit of history. Again, as, as Laco said, when I was a kid, I was in grad school and hanging around people that were doing things like this. And, you know, ironically, some of the, the, the beautiful measurements at Yale of, of the Cooper pair box and showing its intrinsic coherence, the qubit frequency was actually up above 70 gigahertz. That's one of those things you don't notice unless you're looking for but for me, nothing more than existence proof that even aluminum devices whose gap frequency is not that far from here uh, still can be quantum coherent devices as you push to higher and higher frequencies. The reasons why millimeter wave, again, I will use the analog with, with telecommunications, the same reason that 5G is coming. You have lots of frequency crowding that you can spread into a new regime of the spectrum. Uh, what I'm excited about is the ability to still use superconductors. And as I said, for aluminum, that's around 100 gigahertz, but things like niobium can easily push up to close to a terahertz. You have the natural smaller footprints, and you don't need to be as cryogenic. Again, we all worry about, well, our fridge says that it's at 10 millikelvin, but how cold is your actual cavity or qubit? And here, if you move to the higher frequencies, you just win. And lastly, from an optomechanics perspective, or some of these optomechanical technologies, Amazingly, you can push to these higher G knots. So just as a scale for some of these circuits, this is one of our traditional inductor capacitor electromechanical circuits. It's about a 10 nanohenry inductor with maybe a 30 femtofarad optomechanical capacitor. And we get G knots that are hundreds of Hertz. Cooperativities of really normalizing these coupling rates to the dissipation in the system or the decoherence of the system of about 0 0.01. If we just rescale this thing so it resonates at 30 gigahertz, well, you can move your cavity frequency up. You can get huge wins, more than linear wins in your coupling strength. And then in your cooperatively, again, you get beyond linear scaling. So these are ways to really or revolutionize potentially the quantum cooperativity or what we're able to do with these devices by orders of magnitude. That's personally some of the things that I'm excited about. And lastly, at NIST, we're starting efforts to try to push toward just seeing, can we take our bread and butter microwave uh, kind of quantum optics toolbox and push it up to higher frequencies 
for to do other things uh, to see what's possible. And again, take advantage of our favorite nonlinear circuit element, that of the Joseph injunction. Just to see what some of these things we've set up, really what we're doing is wiring our dill fridge, not with traditional coax cables, but using rectangular waveguides. Over here, you can see a, a circuit that we have. You can mount chips directly as a wireless mount into a chip holder. Things that have been done down at the microwave frequencies, you can couple with superinducting rectangular waveguide to low loss to commercial cryogenic amp amplifiers that can have added noise actually of only maybe five or six quanta or so. So these are the types of things we're just starting to play around with. And I think we and other people are, are, are starting to explore the pros and the cons. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up to make sure I leave time for questions. I, I hope today you got a flavor for uh, what we do at NIST, uh, really take the bread and butter of the known quantum technology and seeing how we can push the bounds, how we can couple these things together in non-trivial ways, or use the best of both worlds between moving between different parts of the spectrum. So with that, I will stop there and thank all the people that are part of the lab and thank you for your time. Thank you, John, very much for the really uh, wonderful talk. Also, maybe my first question is, can you tell us more about this picture? <laughs> oh, uh, let's see. Uh, Gabe Peterson, our grad student who graduated, uh, he and his wife actually did this cross stitch of our group picture that I showed you at the beginning. And uh, I, this is the best picture I could ever have. So this is going to be the group picture, even though people will come and go from it. And uh, yeah, despite the fact I'm not sure I can point out which one's me in that picture, I, I'm one of them. And apparently it says it's this one. Wonderful. Uh, a question from Alp from Berkeley. Uh, what are your thoughts on moving from photodiodes to electro-optic modulators on the qubit drive side? This could in principle avoid the optical absorption at the photodiode and use a coherent tie two process. I uh, that's exactly right. I mean, these are ideas uh, which I love deeply. Again, intrinsically in, EN, in EOM is a more dispersive way to generate the microwaves uh, because the optical power is not dissipated and in principle could be routed back up to room temperature. So those are the things that make me say, definitely we should go that way. The reality check, unfortunately, is EOMs are just too if inefficient or the jargon is the VPI is just not the right order of magnitude to generate the powers that you need. So I think we would like to play around to see if some of these things do work. Uh, there's the paper I referenced from the Kippenberg group of playing around with some of these going the other way, but it's a reciprocal process between, you know, encoding microwaves on the light or light on the microwaves uh, going one way or another. So I think the technology is not there. As people are doing more nanofab things, that might push it to a viable technology. But again, that's still, state of the art done in a clean room proof of principle type research. And for those of us who are not so deep in this part of the field, could you tell us more about what VPI means and what it characterizes? Yeah, uh, it's basically asking what amplitude of your microwave signal, what is the voltage you would need to get a pi phase shift? Uh, and so it's kind of uh, the jargon for characterizing what I would call either the efficiency of modulation or the coupling between uh, in the microwave degrees of freedom. And so if you were just to think about, you know, on one hand, uh, an EOM is a microwave to optical transducer. If you were to characterize it as an efficiency, again, the efficiencies are per per million or less. I mean, these are very, very small uh, type things. And these are because these are big crystals where the electric field just, you really have to get a big electric field across some crystal to get a, a relevant uh, a relevant effect on the on the light. Gotcha. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, maybe can you tell us a bit more about? So it seems like you still need the bias for all the photodiodes. You still have you, you can't be quite all optical, right? I guess you still have to have some low pass filters on that PD line for the bias. I, so let's see. I, I actually glossed over this completely. Uh, traditionally, you would DC bias your photodiode to get the best linearity and dynamic range. Uh, in our measurements, we tried it with and without uh, a DC voltage bias. And actually all the measurements I showed, I think were with zero voltage bias. And again, where you really see the difference is if you were using large amounts of optical power, which we're not doing again for quantum experiments. 
it looks like you can get away with even without the DC bias there. And then okay, so on the I'm second part of your see. question about the middlemen between the photodiode and the device, like what low pass filters are things there. We started with lots of low pass filters and some absorptive filters and even a circulator. That's where we began for these proof of principle. I think systematically taking them away and seeing whether it works or not, like that's that's part of the, the, the logical next steps. Got it, got it, wonderful. Oh, by the way, folks, if if you if I missed your question or if you have final questions here, just post them in the chat and we'll bring them up to John as we go through this. Um, maybe one other sort of more basic question on the coupling. Uh, it, it wasn't quite clear to me at least how uh, the coupling to the PD works uh, inside the fridge, whether this was, you know, some fiber splicing or whatnot, because, you know, if you don't have that, I guess you have alignment issues with shrinking, uh, thermal shrinking and so forth. Uh, that's right. So the device that we used, uh, as I said, it was a commercially packaged device that we spliced into the fridge on the fiber. Uh, uh, we have done some work of running our own fiber down. I, I think a continued problem, our responsivity when we get pulled, exactly how much, uh, how much photo current we get per optical power did go down a little bit when we got cold. Our best guess is that's a bit of the thermal contractions misaligning us around. I think some of these, there's known technologies and known ways to be robust to that, but separating that from whether it's actual thermal changes in the photodiode itself or kind of just stupid mechanical changes from misalignment, I think that's also open areas of research. Got it. Um... By the way, there's a comment here that, <laughs> so the next presentation, the only shame is that it couldn't be twice as long. I, th I thought I would uh, bring that up and share it with you. <laughs> uh, um, and I'm scrolling up through the comments. So if I'm if I'm missing your question, folks, please repost it now before we uh, come towards the end here. And uh, maybe if you could just in a final state, tell us about you sort of touched on this already, but just to kind of summarize for us uh, what you think is maybe the most challenging part of the next step in advancing this, or where's the main challenge? Yeah, I, I, I as I said, I, uh, I don't want to come away with the idea that this is a solved problem, that everybody should throw out their coaxes and just put fibers in there. I think the proof of principle is super encouraging, but encouraging is the right way to say, like, I think this is a research path. Uh, predominantly, the thing that is the, the biggest intrinsic uh, drawback to me is that we dissipate the optical power. So when we use a microwatt of optical power, that's a microwatt that your fridge has to handle. And again, if it's only on for 10 nanoseconds or something to do a gate pulse, that's not so bad. But as you start to scale and use this for the very things I talked about, all those 10 nanoseconds and all those optical powers add up. And you know my colleagues, uh, namely Frank Quinlan, is uh, does a lot of work using uh, generating many microwave pulses. You know, if you just uh, use a pulsed laser, you can get many Miller tones. You don't just have to get one sine wave out in the microwave. So thinking about clever ways to multiplex and be power efficient, that's also kind of a bit of the frontier uh, to to really make this you know scalable technology. That's great. Yeah, I think the multiplexing was one of the next questions and maybe just right on this theme from Caleb to clarify, uh, do you anticipate needing one laser per qubit or can you consolidate DMUX at either end? I, in our grand division, yes, we're going to we're going to mux in DMUX all over the place. But even if you just start with the brute force way of one laser, one fiber and one photodiode per qubit, that is actually not a crazy way to scale. Uh, that is something that, you know, again is there's nothing ridiculous about just doing it that way and of course we think there are better more efficient ways to do that but that's not where we're starting right now uh more just brainstorming about whether it's worth the trouble i guess is the hundred dollar question great thank you john and from uh, abram have you thought about using squeeze light to mitigate the shot noise i i only uh about as much as the level of asking that question uh when <laughs> Uh, I start, started these conversations with Frank. He and I shared a, a, a love of thinking about the noise processes. And again, in the time and frequency division, where part of what they do is measure microwave frequencies at the 10 to the minus 18 level accuracy, 
they know their noise very, very well, and they've thought a lot about it, uh, about ways to do better and do better to get around classical noise and even to do some fancy things. So these are things that I've thought about exactly whether, again, whether it's worth the trouble or whether it's an actual benefit from the perspectives of qubits or other things. I don't know, but I think it's a, uh, it's a, a, a beautiful idea to play around with and to think about. Thank you, John. And uh, maybe before we end here, um, seeing as we're more than 10, 11 minutes over, I thought I would just leave it open to you if you want to share any final words with us. I, once again, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. The seminar, I think, has been wonderful. I, like many people at the beginning of the pandemic, when I was going stir crazy in my house, was so excited just to see colleagues, even if it was virtually, and hear about good science. Uh, so I'm glad I could be a part of it. Thank you. Likewise, congratulations to you, John, and to the colleagues on uh, on really, really very nice work. Um, you see in the comment chat box afterwards that there are a lot of folks saying, uh, "I'm glad you popped up on my radar. Great experiment, you know, et cetera, et cetera." So I think people really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks, for tuning in. This talk will stay live, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. And to know what's coming up next week, subscribe to. Kiss Kid YouTube. And with that, we'll see you next Friday at noon Eastern time.